The local government news roundup is proudly supported by Davidson. For 30 years, Davidson has been strengthening the local government sector by identifying and providing the people, expertise and experience that local government needs to enhance its capability, productivity and performance. Davidson is nationally recognised for its executive recruitment services and over the past four years has built a business advisory practice rapidly evolving into one of the nation's foremost and trusted local government business consultancy firms. The Davidson methodology and approach is simple. Thinking beyond now and aiming to be a valued partner with your local government, not just for the immediate project, but for the next 30 years. Speak to Justin Hanney or Seamus Scanlon to find out more or head to davidsonwp.com.au. Davidson, your future, your partner. Today on the Local Government News Roundup, a public inquiry and likely suspension for Liverpool Council, a finding of misconduct against a Port Phillip councillor, a proposal to turn off billboards overnight in the city of Melbourne, a dramatic increase in illegal dumping reports raising concerns, dog waste bags present an environmental issue on the Gold Coast, defamation warnings at Adelaide City Council and the dire state of finances at some UK councils making news again. Just some of the many local government stories getting our attention today. Let's round them up now. Good morning, it's Friday the 19th of July. I'm Chris Eddy, back with the Local Government News Roundup. Also today, the capital city mayor heading to Harvard and a rural mayor goes on the attack over the federal government's water buyback scheme. The podcast is brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association, the national broadcaster on all things local government, with support from Davidson, the nationally recognised local government recruitment and business advisory service. The biggest local government story of the moment is that out of Liverpool City Council and I'll have that for you at the head of our national roundup in just a few minutes time. Firstly, some stories from around Victoria and a City of Port Phillip councillor has been found by an arbiter to have engaged in misconduct with a Facebook post that included statements about some of his fellow councillors. Councillor Robbie Niagui made accusations that the arbiter found to be false in relation to the way councillors Christina Sirikoff and Andrew Bond had voted on an LGBTIQA plus action plan and linking a decision to cancel a drag storytime event to actions taken by neo-Nazis. The arbiter, Yehudi Blasher, directed Councillor Niagui to publicly apologise to Councillors Sirikoff and Bond at the next meeting of the Council and also make a public apology and delete the social media post in question. He will also be required to undertake training in the appropriate use of social media. Melbourne City Council is considering a proposal to turn off large digital billboards late at night to reduce light pollution and its health and environmental impacts. A review has recommended banning above-ground illuminated signage in the CBD between midnight and sunrise on weekdays and 1am to sunrise on weekends to minimise artificial light's impact on sleep, circadian rhythms and biodiversity. The Guardian has reported that the recommendations will be discussed at the Council's future Melbourne committee meeting next week. Strathbogie Shire Council CEO Julie Salomon has departed the organisation this week and is stepping away from the sector after 30 years for a sabbatical. Former South Gippsland CEO and recent interim at Campaspe and Kingston, Tim Tamlin, has stepped in this week as interim CEO for up to 12 months. Mr Tamlin is expected to oversee the induction of newly elected councillors later this year when the council comes out of administration and to support the councillors in the process of appointing a new CEO in 2025. Banyul City Council has adopted one of the state's first Aboriginal self-determination strategies this week. 
The strategy, called Maragil, which means powerful in the Woiwurrung language, aims to create a safe and equitable environment where local First Nations community members can thrive. CEO Alison Beckwith said the strategy was the result of a significant collaboration between councillors, staff and the First Nations community of Banyul and is a testament to the need for all levels of government to transform their engagement with Aboriginal people. Construction of the new Melton Hospital will begin this year with the government selecting the Exemplar Health Consortium to deliver the $900 million project. Set for completion in 2029, the hospital will be Victoria's first fully electric facility featuring 24-hour emergency care, 274 beds and various specialised services. The new hospital has been an advocacy priority for Melton City Council for some time, describing it as the biggest social infrastructure project project in Melbourne's Outer West in decades. And the Victorian Government has announced an investment of $2.2 million in library upgrades across the state through the Living Libraries Infrastructure Program. Nineteen projects will receive funding, including the Middle Park Library Activation Project, which will enhance library services and provide improved facilities and technology. Melton, Greater Shepparton, Alpine and Hepburnshire are also among the councils to be successful in the latest round. Here are some Victorian Council briefs. The City of Ballarat has launched a 12-month curbside soft plastics recycling pilot program for 10,000 households. Residents can recycle scrunchable soft plastics using city-supplied orange bags, which should be placed in yellow lid recycling bins. The collected plastics will be sorted, cleaned and recycled into new products. Geographic Naming Victoria has officially renamed Sydenham Park in Keelor North to Yalak Baring Park, meaning river trail in the Woi Wurrung language of the Wurundjeri people. The renaming, endorsed by Brimbank Council and supported by 64.4% of community responses, reflects the park's cultural heritage and Aboriginal archaeological significance. And the city of Whittlesea has endorsed the traditional Aboriginal name Bunjil Naganga Parkland for the area known as Quarry Hills following community consultation. The name, meaning Eagle View, honours the cultural heritage and Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung custodianship of the parkland. The name will be used alongside Quarry Hills for up to five years to aid the transition. This is the Local Government News Roundup for Friday the 19th of July 2024. It's edition number 364. I'm Chris Eddy. Thank you for listening. Our podcast is brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association, presenting a new edition of TGU from VLGA Connect later today on YouTube and podcast. And thanks also to Davidson for support for the podcast, the nationally recognised recruitment and business advisory services to the local government sector. Now for our national roundup, and in major news breaking yesterday, the New South Wales government has given Liverpool City Council one week to justify why it should not be suspended following the release of an interim report alleging dysfunction, maladministration and interference by councillors in council operations. Local Government Minister Ron Honig announced a public inquiry and a potential suspension of the Council after investigators identified matters sufficient in seriousness and volume to warrant an immediate inquiry. The alleged dysfunction is said to have jeopardised major housing and aerotropolis precinct projects, according to the report. An Office of Local Government statement also said the interim report revealed a strong likelihood of additional issues affecting the operations of the Council that are yet to be identified. The investigation was commenced in April after the sacking of CEO John Ajaka, the tenth person to hold the CEO position at the Council in the last eight years. Mr Ajaka is taking legal action alleging unfair dismissal. The report will also be referred to the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption due to the seriousness of some of the allegations. Planned council elections in September will be suspended while the inquiry is conducted, but Mayor Ned Manoon has reportedly vowed to explore legal options to ensure they proceed as scheduled. He has denied claims of interference in development applications and said the report was a shopping list of unfounded allegations by unknown people with a grudge. 
A new report from ABC News this morning reveals divided opinions amongst Liverpool councillors, some of whom say they support a suspension of the council while an inquiry takes place. Mr Ross Glover has been appointed as the commissioner to undertake the inquiry. In the event of a suspension of the council, an interim administrator will be appointed to perform the functions of a governing body. To other news, Inner West Council in Sydney has reported a significant rise in illegal dumping since switching to the FOGO recycling method and fortnightly garbage collections. From July 2023 to May 2024, there were 12,755 illegal dumping reports, surpassing the previous year's figures. The Daily Telegraph reported that the Council has received a $60,000 grant to fund a surveillance project to monitor known dumping hotspots. Fines and penalties for illegal dumping in New South Wales have recently been increased to a maximum of $2 million and seven years imprisonment. At Singleton Council, a 42-tonne haul of illegally dumped waste at a site in Singleton Heights has reignited calls for people to consider their impact on the community and the environment when disposing of rubbish. The cost to clean up the piles of mixed waste has been estimated at $30,000 and took three days to complete. Katie Hardy, the Council's Acting Director of Infrastructure and Planning, said the Council's rangers respond to up to 100 reports of illegal dumping each year and the clean-up costs for the community is in the tens of thousands of dollars that could be better spent on facilities and services to support local residents. Kiama Municipal Council has signed a $95 million contract with Hall and Prior Aged Care for the sale of Blue Haven Bonera, with settlement set for the 1st of November. The sale, endorsed at a recent council meeting, is expected to improve the council's financial stability while ensuring high-quality care for residents. The sale proceeds after adjustments are estimated at $26 million. Staff will be transferred to Hall and Prior under terms ensuring no loss of entitlements, and the Council will also pursue legal action regarding building defects that affected the sale price. The Federal Government's water buyback scheme has prompted a scathing response from another rural mayor. The Narendra Argus has published an open letter from Murrumbidgee Mayor Ruth McRae OAM to the Prime Minister accusing the Government of having no care for rural Australia and saying goodbye to small business. She said the scheme was an idiotic decision that will have real impact on real people describing a domino effect that will lead to people leaving rural communities and increasing isolation for those left behind. On the Gold Coast, the City Council is facing an environmental issue with nearly 13 million plastic dog waste bags used annually, contributing about 23 tonnes of plastic waste to landfill. ABC News has reported on how the Council is reviewing its dog waste bag policy to explore environmentally friendly alternatives such as compostable bags, while also noting concerns about cost and practicality. The current plastic bags, which contain heavy metals, break down into harmful microplastics. The Council's Planning and Regulation Committee is conducting further workshops and consultations to address the problem. And the City of Moreton Bay's Mayor, Peter Flannery, is urging the state to fund improved public transport, highlighting the area's inadequate services and rapid population growth. The Hills District was identified as having the worst public transport availability in a Climate Council report. Mayor Flannery has criticised the state's lack of meaningful public transport planning and called for action to prevent worsening congestion, especially in light of Brisbane's severe traffic issues. Briefly in other news, Snowy Valleys Council has approved Richmond Park in Tumut as the new site for a multi-purpose centre, which will also serve as an evacuation centre. The project, funded by a $10.7 million grant from the federal government's Bushfire Local Economic Recovery Fund, is expected to begin construction before June next year. Queensland's Redland City Council will present seven key motions at the LGAQ annual conference in Brisbane in October. One motion requests that the government provide for full cost recovery for local governments to undertake fire and management responsibilities, while another will advocate for the return of Youth Week grant funding. Fremantle City Council has agreed to a new 10-year lease for the iconic Ferris wheel at the Esplanade Reserve. A new wheel will be installed with 24 fully enclosed gondolas and increase of two on the previous wheel. 
And the City of Coburn CEO Daniel Sims has announced the appointment of new directors under a restructured executive team. Carissa Bywater and Kylie Johnson have joined the team in the corporate and system services and community and place portfolios respectively under a revised structure that has seen the number of directorates reduced from six to four. The Lord Mayor of the City of Hobart, Anna Reynolds, has been selected for the Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative, joining 39 mayors from 11 countries for a year-long executive education and management training program. The initiative, established by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Harvard Kennedy School and Harvard Business School, aims to enhance the problem-solving capacity and governance of city leaders. Two senior staff from Hobart will also participate with all costs covered by the initiative. The program has trained 314 mayors and over 540 senior city leaders globally since 2017. Adelaide City Councillor Henry Davis has reportedly issued defamation warnings to fellow councillors Janet Giles and Philip Martin over allegations of misogyny made during a council meeting. In Daily reported that statements criticising Councillor Davis's behaviour and social media activity were deemed defamatory by Councillor Davis. The notices demand apologies and retractions at the next council meeting. Councillor Davis has also faced defamation notices from Lord Mayor Jane Lomax-Smith, but he has refused to apologise or retract his statements. And in Western Australia, Perth City Council has approved a 2.95% rate increase as part of its $299 million annual budget. The rate rise is one of the lowest in the Perth metropolitan area and is expected to generate $107 million in revenue and a $6 million surplus. Key budget allocations include $12.5 million for an aquatic centre at the WACA, $4 $4 million for the redevelopment of Perth Concert Hall and $1 million for event infrastructure in the Supreme Court Gardens. Work will also start on a riverfront master plan aimed at unlocking the potential of the Swan River. And Melville Council has approved a feasibility study to explore redeveloping three council-owned blocks into car parking, accommodation and tourism-related uses. Perth now reported that the study will consider potential sale, long-term lease or development options to generate revenue and support the Apple Cross Canning Bridge Activity Centre amid expected tourism and population growth. The state government has allocated 10,830 homes to be built in the city of Melville's Canning Bridge precinct by 2031. Now for our global roundup, some stories out of the UK. Firstly, the City of York Council is facing a financial crisis, needing to cut £30 million from services over the next three years to balance its budget. The Council has launched its largest budget consultation, urging residents to prioritise which services to cut or reduce, according to a BBC News report. Plans include selling assets and proposing a 4.99% council tax increase. Council leaders say it's crucial they receive resident feedback in making these difficult decisions. Thurrock Council, effectively bankrupt due to failed investments, has revealed it needs to borrow £26 million more from the government than initially indicated. A total of £206.7 million is needed to balance the budget. The Council has debt of more than £400 million and raised its council tax by 8% this year. And Shropshire Council is looking to save £27 million by cutting approximately 540 full-time jobs. Only 200 applications for voluntary redundancy have been received so far, meaning compulsory redundancies are likely and there'll also be cuts to spending on contractors. BBC News reported that the Council is under pressure to save £62.5 million this financial year. Two West Suffolk councillors, Andy Drummond and Nick Clark, have been found in serious breach of conduct rules, including bullying, discrimination and harassment. Both breached six codes of conduct, leading to sanctions, including removal from committee roles and the requirement to write apology letters. But as BBC News reported, Councillor Clark has refused to apologise, worsening the situation, according to Council Leader Cliff Waterman, while Councillor Drummond's apology was cut short to avoid disclosing private information. 
The new UK Deputy Prime Minister, Angela Rayner, is initiating a devolution revolution to transfer more powers from Westminster to local authorities. Ahead of this week's King's Speech, she reportedly reached out to council leaders not currently under a devolution deal, encouraging them to partner with the government to drive economic growth across the country. The UK Local Government Association has responded to the King's Speech, which it says included a number of positive bills and encouraging signs that the government recognises the critical role of councils in solving national challenges. It said for councils to be able to deliver, it is crucial that they have adequate long-term funding and more financial certainty through multi-year settlements. In the US, Mayor Eric Adams' City of Yes initiative aimed at addressing New York City's housing crisis by adding thousands of new homes and revising zoning laws is facing significant opposition from City Council members. Critics are arguing that the chosen areas, particularly in the East Bronx, lack essential infrastructure such as schools, police, fire services and sewers to support an influx of new residents. The New York Post reported that there's been some support from borough presidents, but the plan's rapid implementation and focus on large developers have sparked calls for a more measured approach. And finally to Canada, a former chair of the City of Montreal's Executive Committee will face a corruption trial after the Supreme Court of Canada refused to hear his appeal. CBC News reported that Frank Zampino, described as the right-hand man to former Mayor Gerald Tremblay, is facing charges of fraud, breach of trust and municipal corruption related to awarding municipal contracts in exchange for political donations. A previous stay of charges due to police wiretap violations was overturned by Quebec's Court of Appeal. The trial is set for January 2025. And the Deputy Mayor of Canada's City of St. John's, Sheila O'Leary, has won the Municipal World Women of Influence in Local Government Award. The award celebrates women who have made significant contributions to local government, whether on the administrative or political side. It recognises women who have demonstrated leadership, strength and determination, as well as grace under pressure. That's the latest from the Roundup for the 19th of July, 2024, edition number 364, brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association with support from Davidson. You can find the links to the stories referenced in today's episode and a full transcript at lgnewsroundup.com. While you're there, check out the latest breaking news updates and learn how you can support the Roundup by becoming a subscriber through a small monthly contribution, which you can cancel at any time. The Local Government News Roundup is recorded in the city of Greater Geelong, Victoria, on the land of the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I'll be back with more Local Government News very soon. Until next time, thanks for listening and bye for now.